so thanks everyone for coming. Um, ignoring the pun, the, the session today is going to be, mass, uh, we're going to be talking around mastering Power BI deployment uh, with Git integration. Uh, for introduction purposes, my name is David Mitchell. I'm a cloud solution architect at Microsoft. I've been working in and around data for, for 15 years. Been coming to SQL Bits for a number of years now, but this is my first time speaking. Uh, I'm not here representing Microsoft. I've just got an interest in uh, Power BI and Git integration, so submitted the session and, and here we are. Uh, the barcode on there is for, uh, for you to scan. Probably I'll throw it back up at the end, uh, but any feedback you've got on the session would, would, be, uh, would be greatly appreciated. Um, so why did I want to run this session? I think, I think we've all been there. We've all maybe deployed reports to production when there was a bug or an error and we've been unable to, to revert back. We've not go, got no quality controls in place, anything like that. So I'm, I'm guilty of that in a, in a past life where I've maybe saved the report. We've, we've lost the history. There's been no, bit, no way to, to revert back or we've had to rebuild the, the report or the semantic model. Um, so what, one thing I'm keen on, on sort of looking at is how do we ensure sort of consistency and quality across our environments, you know, most, most particular production. Um, how can we track any changes uh, and version control of our, of our Power BI reports and also semantic models? And then how can we collaborate with others? So you're all probably familiar with working with a PBIX file. It's, you know, one person can, can work on that. We can't share that between multiple people. So I want to try and address a few of those issues um, as, we, as we go along as well. Um, so the how, how, how can we do that? How can we achieve this? Um, I'd like to sort of briefly introduce uh, the concept of data ops. There's plenty of resources online around this. So if you look up uh, John Kersky's blog, he covers this in great detail, but I thought I'd introduce it as a, as a concept in this session. Um, it's inspired by the principles of DevOps, Agile, and, and Lean Manufacturing. Um, and at its core, DataOps is a collaborative data management practice aimed at improving the communication, integration, and automation of data flows between data managers and consumers at the, you know, at the far right end of that. Um, it's not just a, a set of practices, it's, it's a culture shift within, within the organization um, to promote that agility uh, and responsiveness through our, our data development and data pipelines. Um, what, what, the what here is, what, what can we use to help us support that process? Um, in particular, I'm gonna talk around Azure DevOps, um, which, is, which is a tool which has those, those repositories, specifically the, the, the Git integration, where we can do things like continuous integration and continuous deployment. We're not gonna go too, too deep on, on the concepts of those things. I'm hoping that some of you may have already heard those terms, but, um, this is what we'll be covering during the session. So it'll be a combination of Power BI native functionality and also um, Azure DevOps. It allows us to do things like version control within, within the repository. So that scenario we talked around previously where we've deployed to production, we've done something error, we need to roll back or we need to apply a fix. We can do that with, our, with version control within, within the repository. We can touch things like monitoring, testing, and we've got some demos and scenarios that we'll, we'll cover a bit later on. Um, and then sort of collaboration and governance, again, coming back to those sort of key issues that I identified on the, on the first slide. So moving on. So Power BI deployment. I want to initially sort of level set, just in case there are, isn't anyone in here, but hopefully we're all familiar using Power BI desktop and how we deploy to, to our workspaces in, in the service. I want to touch on a premium feature called Power BI Deployment Pipelines, and we'll cover that in a little bit more detail uh, shortly. And then finally, how can we wrap that up and use Azure DevOps to automate and combine those, those two processes? So Power BI Desktop, we've all seen, hopefully seen this window when we've created a report or a semantic model, and we want to, we want to publish that to the service. We'll see this pop-up window. We'll pick the selected workspace that we want to deploy to, and we'll, we'll, we'll deploy our reports. We can change data sources within, within the, the desktop application. We can update connection strings, things like that. And then some, some of you may be using things like Teams or OneDrive or SharePoint for some, some sort of version control. Um, and then maybe some of us have been in this scenario where we've got multiple versions of the same file. Where do we start in terms of trying to identify which is the right, the right version for us to update and then carry on development? So. We're gonna try and get away from that during this session today. Deployment pipelines. 
Um, it's a Power BI premium feature. It allows us to, to clone content from, from one stage to, to another. And when I talk around stages, I'm talking things like development, test, pre-prod, all the way through to production. Um, when it originally launched, Power BI uh, deployment pipelines was three stages. It's now been expanded to range from two to 10 stages um, within, within the service. So it's gonna jump into a quick demo now. Um, what we've got here, we've got our Power BI, uh, Power BI report, which is looking at, I think, passenger data across various uh, countries over, over a number of years. It's very cr crude, tried to keep it on the theme of, of aviation, but that's not the, the, the subject matter here. So uh, we've got our report, we've got our semantic model. It's in a premium workspace. We can tell that by the, the icon. I've already pre-created a, a deployment pipeline and we can see on the left-hand side that there's our development uh, workspace. So it's got our semantic model. We can click deploy. What that will now do is copy the content from our development stage. We don't have a test stage or test workspace created, so the pipeline will automatically create that workspace for us. Once that's created, it will then copy over the semantic model and the report from the development workspace and publish that into, into test. We can look at things like uh, deployment rules, so we can now go in and apply rules. So if we're working in development, we're maybe looking at a development server or development source. We then need to repoint that to our test data source, so we can configure all that within the service, define connection strings, update parameters, uh, all of that through the through the service. And then we can also look at deployment history. So there'll be th who's deployed what, what's been deployed to the various stages, and then there's also a, a, a notes field which we'll we'll touch on a little bit later on. Uh, once we've done that, we can then look at the workspaces on the left-hand side. We can see now that it's created our brand new workspace. Um, it's given it a suffix of, of test, and then there's our report and, and semantic model that's, that's been deployed. So touching on those deployment stages again, um, you can see on the, the screenshot here, maybe it, it's a bit too small for the people at the back, but we've got our development test and production stage. As we've created our test environment, it's created a new workspace, but production hasn't been assigned to a workspace yet. So we may already have a production workspace elsewhere in the service, maybe on a different capacity. We can go and pick that from the dropdown and assign that to, to our production stage. The deployment pipelines will then just continue and allow us to, to move that content between the stages. Um, and we're just gonna move on to a, a demonstration now that so it shows how we can identify what artifacts within the service have been changed or, or need updating through, um, through the pipeline. So we've got our report. Um, as we've seen, one issue that we've had feedback on is that the logo's in the incorrect place. It needs to be in the, in the top left-hand corner. There may be all the validation issues that we've had or failures in, failures in test. Maybe some measures are, are defined incorrectly and we need to fix those. So we'll make the change. We'll deploy that to our development workspace. This will then deploy. Just give it a minute. We'll then jump into the workspace within our development workspace. And we can see now that the logo is in the top left hand side. So that, that's all standard. We've all seen that before. We've all deployed to, to our workspaces. We'll quickly jump into to test just to validate the report we can still see that the logo is in the top right-hand corner, so it's in the incorrect place. What we'll then need to do is to drop into the deployment pipeline. So it's still very manual at the moment. We're just going through the mechanics of it. I wanted to make people aware, but you can see the icon here is flagged that there are discrepancies between the two, two workspaces. We can see because they've been deployed as a single artifact, the semantic model and the report are being flagged as different. Um, so we can go in, we can add a note, what why we're deploying from, from dev to test. So we're just gonna say logo change. Click deploy, the pipeline will do its thing. It will update the report and we'll be able to go in. We'll look at the, um, the deployment history. We can see what artifacts were different, what's been deployed. And then we can also see the, the deployment note that we've added to the workspace as well. So just lastly, just to confirm that the process has run through, um, we can see now the logo is in the correct place and we're happy now so our, our testers can continue with testing, happy with the report, and once they are happy, we can then deploy that to production. We won't go through the full life cycle in this demo, but you know that, that hopefully that's 
obvious to you that we can we can do that. Um, so just touching on what's deployed and what's not deployed, what's overwritten. Um, there's a there's a fully comprehensive list um, if you just search on Microsoft Learn. Um, data flows are supported, data flows gen one, paginated reports, our Power BI reports and semantic models. Um, and then the types of properties that are, are copied across. So things like report visuals, uh, any charts, any metadata, such as measure descriptions, measure definitions, relationships within our model. The two with the asterisks are our data sources and parameters because we can overwrite those with the deployment rules that we saw in the, in the original demo. So we can change connection strings from our say dev server to our test server, say if it was a SQL source. So we, we can do that. Um, so now we want to move on to, to Azure DevOps and how we can um, sort of now start to automate those processes and think if we start working at scale, you know, maybe we've got a number of developers working on our reports that we want to sort of put into sort of feature branches or release branches and then control that deployment through, through the sort of development cycle. Um, again, touching on sort of the, you may already have and be using uh, Azure DevOps for maybe sort of your Databricks workloads or Azure SQL, any of those other services. So it's now trying to bring Power BI into that world. I'm guessing a lot for a lot of people, and it was for me before sort of these things came about, it was your data platform was built and stored in sort of DevOps or in a Git repository. You manage that full cycle. You've done all your automated deployments with ARM templates and everything else. And then Power BI was still a very manual process of go into desktop, change connection strings, and fire them, you know, deploy them to the relevant service. So we're trying to address those problems as, as, as we go through now. And prerequisites to this, um, need to go and enable the um, REST APIs within the service. So go into the tenant admin, enable REST API calls. We need to create a app, res app res uh, registration, excuse me, uh, within Entra ID. And then we need to give that the permissions on the Power BI REST APIs. And we're just going to go through now a scenario where we're going to take a report and we're going to deploy it to the service. So here we are in Power BI Desktop. I'm just going to validate that we can only see the two pre-existing workspaces that we had previously. We're going to jump into, into Azure DevOps and take a look at our repository. Within our repository, we've got um, various different artifacts. We'll start off with our... Um, our YAML, so which is our, our definition for our, our release pipeline within Azure DevOps. In here, there's various different tax, tasks, like installing the Power BI commandlets, which is just a, a PowerShell module uh, that we need to install to be able to invoke some of those modules and execute the, the REST APIs. And then we see we've got another, another two PowerShell scripts as well. So first one, quite simple, install the modules um, within, within the, re, uh, the, the agent. And then we've got a create workspace uh, PowerShell script, which we'll go through, define that workspace. And then finally, the second one looks at this scenario two folder, and that's the folder that we've got um, our report stored in. So say, for example, we could organize our folder structure by workspace, for example, we can sort of parameterize that. So we're gonna jump in now, we're gonna create a, a pipeline. We're gonna create create the pipeline based off a, a repository. So the YAML file that's already defined within our, our repository. So we're gonna use an existing pipeline. You see, it's exactly the same as we have already defined within our repository. We're gonna click run. And what this will now do is invoke that, 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 that pipeline and start to go through the process. So we'll just jump into the task, skipping ahead because we don't need to wait and wait for the, the pipeline to start. It's gonna do some initialization tasks at the start. And then you can see the one that we've created is the install Power BI ma uh, management modules. Once those are installed, it'll now start going through. That PowerShell will create the workspace. All of this is just invoking the Power BI REST APIs. So if you're unfamiliar with those, they are they already exist within, uh, you can go and view them in Microsoft Learn. There's a, a try it now feature. So you can actually test out and try the API calls from within the browser. So you can see the results straight away. It's then gonna go and deploy our reports once the workspace has been created. 
So everything in that scenario two folder is now going to be deployed to our to our workspace. So we'll wait for the job to complete. We'll need to refresh our browser so that the, the workspace list is up to date. And then we can see the number two DevOps deployment. So that workspace has now been created. There's our report and there's our semantic model. So again, we've taken that step in the in the you know in the first scenario where someone's in desktop and deploying and creating a report and then deploying to the service. We've now automated that through DevOps. So if we think in terms of being able to scale this out across maybe a wider team, you know, maybe there's there's some things that we touch on a bit later on around center of excellence and maybe guidelines and rules that you define in your reports and semantic models. Um, and we'll, we'll touch on that shortly. Um, so how do we deploy things to the next stage? Hopefully um, you may have noticed that none of this required um, Power BI Premium. This was just all invoking the Power BI REST APIs. We were able to create the workspace, deploy the reports. Now we want to take DevOps and then automate that deployment pipeline process. Um, so we'll just jump in. We've got a, another demo. So we can see this workspace is, 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 is a non-premium workspace. So it's a, it's a pro workspace. Um, so we'll jump back into, into DevOps shortly. So looking at our project, looking at our repository, we'll have a new, a new pipeline YAML that I've defined. Um, and I will share the slide, so a lot of this content will, will, will be available to you. Um, so in here, we've got um, two separate tasks. Again, we need to install the, the PowerShell commandlets, and then we're going to execute another, another PowerShell script, which will update the workspace. So we need to get the workspace ID. So again, we're going to do some REST API calls based on the workspace name, retrieve the, API, uh, the workspace ID, get the capacity ID, and then we're going to assign that that workspace to the capacity that we've we, we've decided on. So again, if you've got multiple capacities, this can all be parameter driven within DevOps. Um, we won't be touching on any of those sides of things, but hopefully this plants the seed so that you can take this this further. Once we've once we've done that, we'll create the the pipeline, and then this these next steps will then deploy our content from the development stage into the into the test stage. It's also going to add a note like we did previously where we changed our logo name. And then we're gonna run this scenario three pipeline that had already, already created. And we should be able to watch this one side by side. So the previous one was quite quick, quite instant, create the workspace. But now we're gonna assign the workspace to a, ca uh, a capacity. So um, whilst this is running, it'll do the initialization steps so I can get the other, works the, the other browser window set up. So we're still in our, our DevOps deployment pipeline, which we're going to assign to <clears throat> excuse me, our development stage. So you copy the files. It's going to install the commandlets that we need to do each time. And now it's going to update our workspace. So we'll give the browser a quick refresh. It's not updated yet. It's not up to that stage. It's all held within the within the repository. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, so the question was, where is all the co code held and and all of the artifacts? So they're actually deployed within the um, within the Git repository in DevOps. Um, so just just whilst the demo is playing now, we can see that it's created our our deployment pipeline. It's assigned our DevOps uh, deployment workspace to a premium capacity into the development stage. And then it's copied the artifacts ac uh, across, and we can also see now that um, we've got our deployment note as well in the in the history. So we've taken those. So the idea of this, just just to sort of level set, is to take those steps that we saw in the original demos, and then look to see how we can automate those. So we're starting to do that now. Um, in terms of deployment options, just to summarise again, um, the first demos, the the first step where it was just creating the workspace and deploying the reports. You know, this can be expanded to non-premium workloads. So we're going to take our initial phase, deploy it to, to dev. We can then just create a new development workspace, deploy that content to development without the need for deployment pipelines. So there's no, there's no need for, pre, uh, for the premium deployment pipelines. We can do it all within, within DevOps and just the native REST APIs. So that, that is an option. Um, and then the second scenario, 
is where we have still Azure DevOps orchestrating the process and doing our pipelines. We deploy to, to our dev workspace. We then have, when we're ready to go to test, it will just invoke the pipelines. And you can see there from this, this second uh, diagram that it's going to copy the content over to the various workspaces rather than doing net new deployments for every, for every environment. Um, so how can we take this to the next level? Um, hopefully some of you may have already or noticed some bad practice that I've been doing in, in terms of this. So everything currently was stored in a single Power BI file, so one single PBIX file. It was an import model, so all of the data was held in that as well. So when I've stored that within the repository, the data is actually being held in the repository. So that's obviously something that we, we wouldn't recommend or I wouldn't recommend, um, like I say here. Um, we want to maybe start looking at thinking how we can save the model to a folder, and we'll touch upon that using Tabular Editor shortly. Um, how can we test and validate prior to deployment? So, like I say, if we've got some rules, maybe against our visuals or against our semantic models, maybe ID fields shouldn't be visible to, to users when they're doing self-serve, we can define some of those rules and test our, our models against them prior to deployment. Um, I'm going to introduce Power BI projects. Um, which is a preview feature, and also workspace Git integration as well. So these are things that are, are in preview, but you can see sort of the trajectory and, and the roadmap to where sort of Microsoft are looking to get Power BI from a, a pro developer experience. Um, so Tabular Editor, hopefully it doesn't need too much introduction, um, but it's a tool that allows us to sort of author and uh, create semantic models, uh, do various th different things like running scripts against our models, They've got a stand outside, so I definitely recommend going and speaking to them if, if, you, if you're unfamiliar with it. But one thing, or two things that I want to focus on during this session is um, how to save models to a folder, and we'll go into more detail on that, and then also best practice analyzer, and that's where we can sort of execute it, you know, these rules against our, against our models. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so saving model to folder, it's, it's a fairly sort of simple process. Once we've got a... Um, a Power BI file, so a PBIX file with a semantic model. Um, we can open Tabular Editor from within uh, within the within the desktop application. We then get the option, like we can see on the screen here. You just go to File, Save to Folder. You'll specify that folder. What Tabular Editor will then do is create a separate JSON file for every artifact within that within that semantic model. So whether that be a table, a column, a measure, a relationship, all of those will be separate JSON files in that folder that, that, that you specify. So what that means for, for Git integration, it allows us you know, a lot more sort of analysis at, at sort of you know, at code level rather than just this binary file, which is a, a PBIX file has changed. We can now start to identify what's actually changed, you know, what are the measures correct. We can do sort of reviews within, within DevOps when we're doing pull requests and things like that. So, um, and again, we'll I'll sort of demo this now. So. This is just a scenario. We've got a, we're working in our branch within, within Azure DevOps. We're going to clone it locally in, in VS Code. We'll pick the folder where we want to sync the repository. And then there we can see, so like we saw in Azure DevOps, we've got that folder structure where our PowerShell scripts are held. The, the YAML files for our pipelines are also stored there. And then we've now got our scenario two folder, which is where our PBIX file is, 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 is saved. So we're going to open that up. We're going to fire that up in, in Power BI Desktop. We're going to go to external tools and then we're going to open Tabular Editor. So this can be done with Tabular Editor 2 as well, which is the, the, the free version. Tabular Editor 3 is a, is a license-based model, but you can still do this within Tabular Editor 2. Um, so once that's done, it's going to prompt me to update, but we'll just ignore that for now. Um, and then we'll go File, Save to Folder, and then I'll be able to show you that folder representation of, of, of the model. Should have sped some of these bits up, really. But 
we're going to select that folder. That's done. And then hopefully I'll speed up and show you the folder structure. So we can see within VS Code now that all of these artifacts have now been created within that repository folder. So, you know, we've got country, it's a single table model, so it's not nothing too advanced. That's why we're only seeing those. But we'll look at the tables. I'll show you in DevOps um, in, in a moment. Uh, so we're going to commit those changes back. So now we're just going to say that we save the model to folder, have that sync back to the to the repository and to the branch that we're working in. Uh, yeah, question. Quick question. When you say, sorry, listen, is it a PDIC or PDIP? When you say folder, for people who particularly do the JSON part of the solution to the JSON part. Yeah, so, so the question was, um, did I save the, um, let's pause this, did I save the, um, the, the file as a PBIT or a PBIP? No, it creates a separate new folder structure. So the PBIX will still exist, but it's just it taking that model, that semantic model, and then saving it as a, as a, as a folder structure. And um, so yeah, we can see here within Azure DevOps now, so this is just a replica of what we've got locally. Um, we've got our table, so our airports table. We've then got all of the various different columns within, within there, so they're all defined as separate JSON files. So now if we start thinking about maybe those more traditional sort of DevOps practices where you know, maybe we're writing some SQL scripts and we want to detect which lines have changed. So we're going to add a new measure now and hopefully you can start to see how that will then appear. So from a, now from a co-developer experience, you know, we're just adding single JSON files, for example, if we create a new measure. So we're going to create a sum of passengers here. All right, very, very sort of crude. We're going to save this to the folder. Then once we commit that back to the repository, um, we're going to see, you know, that new line inserted. So it just means that now two people can work on the same semantic model rather than working on a, a singular PBIX, which means then obviously as, as teams grow, you want to collaborate and work together, this can now, you can now start to enable that. So quickly just looking at the repo. Looking at the history, we've added the new measure to the model. And then you can see now it just illustrates that a new file has been added to the repository. So again, you know, Myself and a, and a colleague could be working on two separate parts of the model, creating measures. We're now we're not going to get any kind of conflicts by maybe just overwriting each other's PBIX, PBIX file. Um, so moving on, I talked around a little bit. So the, those data ops principles, data ops, uh, you know, the, there's an element of, of wanting to test and validate prior, in, prior to deployment. So I'm just going to touch on um, uh, using best practice analyzer within, within Tabular Editor. Like I say, this is, you know, Tabular Editor 2 is free. Best Practice Analyzer is a feature within, within Tabular Editor. It allows you to run rules against your semantic models and Power BI data sets. You can create your own rules. You can test locally. But more importantly, you can automate those tests within, within Azure DevOps as well. Um, Microsoft do have a sort of published list of, of rules that you can apply. So you don't need to go and create a whole whole load yourself you can just take the default and recommended ones from microsoft and then as you're uh, you know as you start to develop you can still maybe start to define some of your own rules as well so you can see on the right hand side there you know there are some examples of the different types of rules you know things like naming conventions performance so removing the auto date time that power bi desktop always re always seems to create behind the scenes so you can disable that feature it'll remove those date tables and then we can just use a single date table within within our model. Um, so what about our visuals? Now, this is something maybe you've not come across before. It's a, it's a fairly new tool. Um, it was developed by a, a colleague of mine, Nat. Um, he's developed this in his own time. So PBI Inspector is similar to Tabular Editor in, ter in terms of best practice analyzer running against your semantic models. PBI Inspector is a, a tool that allows you to run rules against your visuals. So, a power, so think about all of the reports that we create. You know, maybe we could have flagged that um, the logo early on to say it shouldn't have been in the right hand side, should have been in the left hand side. For example, we can define those rules. We can test it locally on our on our desktop client, and it will create a a wireframe representation of our reports and flag the offending issues. So there could be things like, you know, report pages are called page one, page two, page three. 
it'll flag those and say give those meaningful names. So it's trying to catch things before they make their way into production. So the you know see the red icon here, it just illustrates there's an issue and a breach on that on that rule. Um, so we'll just do a quick demo of this. This is provided by uh, Rui Romano. If you haven't heard of Rui, I highly recommend sort of searching him up and looking at some of the the articles and especially his, his GitHub repository. Um, we'll touch on what he's just done there in a bit a little bit later on. But more importantly, we've got a uh, we're going to jump into DevOps. We're going to create a a new pipeline. We're going to jump into his GitHub repository, and he's got a pre-published um, YAML file that we can just copy, paste into our de deployment pipeline, and then I'll show you the, and this will actually now, it'll create two separate jobs, one to test our, our semantic models and our data sets, and then the other job will test our visuals. So if we now start thinking about these processes where we're just, you know, we've started out, we've just started to deploy our reports, now we can start to sort of take a step back, start validating them prior to even getting to our end users in test. So we're catching issues and errors that, that they're, they're, they're aware of already, and it just saves time for the rest of the business. So you can see here it's starting to flag on our semantic model a number of issues. We can jump into the, to those separate jobs, and then we can see them being flagged here. And then similarly, the report is running in parallel. So it's validating, it's running PBI inspector against our models. Um, and you can see a number of rules are being breached there as well. So it just now we can then start to incorporate these steps into our into our processes. You just you're just sort of protecting yourself as a as a, a developer, um, and sort of just getting in our, our testing and validation beforehand. Um, so introduce some PVI projects. As I say, it's a, it's a preview feature at the moment, but hopefully it gives you an idea of the trajectory Microsoft are trying to take with. Power BI as a, as a developer experience. Um, it allows us to, to organize our files in a folder structure, which is, is native in the desktop client, so there's no need for, for tabular editor. Um, it's got Git integration, and more recently, or last year, we announced Tyndall support at SQL Bits. That's now supported as a preview feature within, within desktop as well. Um, so just looking at the video that's playing on the side, hopefully you've caught that whilst I've been talking, but it has a, a folder representation of, of those artifacts. It'll create um, it'll create report folders for our reports and a semantic model. Or it's called data sets currently. We're working on changing that to semantic model. So that will say semantic model in the, in the near future as well. Um, workspace Git integration. Um, if you're already using Premium or, or Fabric, you may have started to see this appear within some of your Premium workspaces. Um, this is just an example scenario of how that, that can work. So on the left-hand side, we've got our developer working locally, maybe doing some semantic modeling, working in their, in their, in their branch, so working in the, the PBIP folder. On the right-hand side, on the bottom, uh, bottom right-hand side, we've got uh, maybe it's a Mac user who doesn't have access to, to Power BI Desktop, they're now able to start creating reports within the workspace. That workspace can be um, linked to a branch within Azure DevOps, and then we can have again have that co-developer experience. They can then be you know merged into a, into a single branch via pull request, and then that can then be released into our our development workspace or our production workspace, depending on how we how we approach it. But hopefully, it sort of gives you an idea of how we're starting to think about integration between sort of desktop clients and non-desktop clients. You got a question? Yeah, yeah. Going back to your point earlier about the integration style of your integration, I think that you would like to think of that same integration as a workspace. Yeah, so the, so the question was asked around um, storing data within our model, so as a PBIX. When we save it to PBIP, that data is not, um, not saved, so it'll create a, a model.bim file. So maybe people uh, have, have seen those before, um, but that is the the definition of the uh, the semantic model. So depending on whether you've turned on the Tim, Timdall feature, it'll be Timsel or Timdall, which is tabular model scripting language and tabular model definition language. Um, so yeah, the, the PBIP won't store the data within the, uh, the repository. Another question? Yeah. 
see any issues? I thought uh, you stopped using Zoom to check your folder and you're starting to use Trimble instead. Um, so, so the question was around um, using tabular editor, save model to folder. That will serialize all the objects as, as separate files, whereas using PBI projects will create the model.bim as a, uh, as a single file with the Tyndall or Timsel language. And the question was, um, do I see any issues with that? Um, from, a, from a developer experience, I, I don't because that model up BIM you can see line by line and we'll have a, a demo of that shortly where we can see um, you know line by line measure definitions and things like that so if the arrays change order for example that will all still be picked up and those those changes can be can be detected in the model as well um, yeah so just jumping into to a demonstration here so I've got my my release branch in in DevOps I'm going to create a we're right, just to finish this this demo, and then we'll I'll come to you. Um, so we're going to create our um, our development branch based off our release branch. So me as a developer, I'm now going to start working uh, within within the service and developing my report. Um, I'm going to clone it locally, so I'm going to do some work in desktop. It's going to fire up Visual Studio Code. It's going to pull that that to my to my local machine. I'll define my folder like we have previously. Sure, we're in the right branch again. So we can see now our scenario six folder. I'm going to view it in File Explorer. And then there we go. We've got our PBIP. And then within there, we've got our report folder and our data set folder. So we can open the PBIP. That will now open Power BI Desktop. And we're just going to get that familiar experience that hopefully we're all familiar with in terms of, of developing. Um, once this fires up, we're going to see the same report. We're going to see the same semantic model that we've got in our previous demos. We can still filter. We're not going to deploy that currently. We're just going to leave that locally on my machine. I'm going to jump into the service. I've got an empty workspace. So what I can do now is I can go to, it's a premium workspace. I can go to the workspace settings, go to Git integration, and now I can start to link this workspace to that development branch that I've, that I've been working on. Um, I'll pick my development branch, and I know that my reports are saved within Scenario 6 as a, as a folder, so it's going to sync that folder to, to this workspace. It'll take a, a couple of seconds, but you can see it's starting to, to synchronize the workspace. We'll start to see the, the semantic model appear. We can see that syncing. It's pulling in from the repository, and then the report should start to appear as well. So we can start to see now that there's no limitation for maybe those Mac users from a, a development standpoint for creating reports. There's our existing report. I think I just need to refresh my um, my browser cache. Yeah, so there's the report. We're, we're happy, we're, we're great. We're, we're, we're back sort of where we were. We've got our content deployed to the workspace. But what I'm gonna do next is um, I'm gonna take that semantic model. I'm gonna create a brand new report Within, within the browser. I'm gonna take my, my total number of passengers and I wanna slice that by year, for example. So it's not the, the best looking report, but it's a report and hopefully, you know, we're just going through the mechanics of it rather than assessing my report design skills. Um, so yeah, we can see it still works. It's based off that, that semantic model. We're gonna save it, we're gonna give it a name. And this is all still just local to, to the workspace. We drop back into the workspace. We can see now that that, that change is actually uncommitted. So it's not, it's not in the repository. We'll go and look on the local developer machine. There's no change. There's nothing reflected for that, for that change. Um, but we can see in the source control tab at the top here, we're gonna, uh, we've got one change that's been highlighted, which is our passenger count report. So we're gonna add a commit message, commit that back, and that will now sync to the repository. And then what should happen is our developer working in, our, in their local environment, in, in their desktop. Just need to pull that in from
So now you can see that this new folder has been created, which is passenger count report. Um, we can see there's a definition.pbir, which is a new file extension for reports. And now we know from our sort of previous examples, the only way that this is going to get this report is going to get through test is if we've got a logo in the top left hand corner. So what I'm going to do locally now, I mean, there's other issues with the report, but the, the, <laughs> we know that previous, um, you know, our previous deployment was we needed a logo. So we're going to load that logo up, which was provided by Bing Chat. We'll stick that in the top left hand corner and then we'll save that. Once I save, we'll then have to commit that back to the repository. So we're just going through the mechanics of conscious. It's quite laborious in terms of a demo, but I just wanted to show every step of the process so that you know it plants that seed for, for when you get back to, to the office. So we can see it's created some uh, an updated report.json. So it's updated the, the PBIR definition. We're going to add the company logo as our, as our commit note or comment, sync that back to the repository. And then lastly, we'll just jump into, into the workspace. Just to complete the picture. So we can look at our passenger count. It's still as it was. It's not going to get anywhere. It's not going to go through test. And um, we'll look at the source control uh, tab. And now we can see that there's a pending change and there's an update required to our report. So we can choose as developers as well when to pull those, those changes through. Um, so we'll pull that through. I'll go into my passenger count report now, and then we can see there's the logo. We're ready to start deploying to test. Um, so that sort of talks through sort of the, the, the workspace Git integration. Um, just to summarize, um, I just want you all to sort of think about where you are in terms of this, this journey. You know, we covered the Power BI desktop approach, which is very manual, very sort of laborious in terms of maintenance, collaboration. Um, start considering Power BI deployment pipelines if you've got premium workspaces or fabric capacities. Um, and then start thinking about Azure DevOps and how we can automate some of those testing and, and deployments. Um, and then lastly, maybe when it comes out of um, preview, thinking about the, the PBI projects and, and Git integration, you know, that, that's the direction of travel that Microsoft are taking with, with Power BI development. And sort of Rui Romano is heavily involved in, in all of those things. Um, and then just a call to action from me. Um, most definitely start using version control in, in some capacity. You know, would recommend it um, sort of straight away as soon as you get back to the office if, you, if you're able to. Most definitely separate your, your reports and semantic models into, into separate files if you're not using PBI projects. That just means that you can take your semantic models, deploy them to the service, and then just create reports with a live connection to those and then that way, you know, your report developers can work in isolation and your semantic modelers and data modelers can work in, in isolation on their, um, in their environment as well. And obviously when PBIP comes along, it is in GA and you're happy to do that, then I definitely consider that and start working that way. Um, save model to folder using tabular editor in the interim. And then maybe going back to your question around which way to use, maybe it's just a, you know, a decision that you make as a, as a developer. Um, and then test your reports and semantic models. So, you know, we've only touched on, on two scenarios. You know, we've, we've touched on tabular ed, the best practice analyzer and PBI inspector, but you're also able to maybe look at things like DAX studio and execute queries against your, your semantic model. So as part of that deployment, maybe check in to see if dimensions have rows in there or facts have got rows in there. We can start doing those types of things as well. Automate our deployments. Again, hopefully that we've covered a lot of that. And then just um, if you can scan the QR code, give me any feedback. And I'm just conscious the gentleman at the back had a question. It does. Yeah, so the, so the comment from the gentleman was um, tabular editor already supports Tyndall. And with it being in preview feature, if anyone was interested, they could at least enable that feature within uh, tabular editor and just see what the differences are between Tyndall and, and Timsel. Um, is, I think there's a question on, yeah, on screen. There's a question. Uh, Daisy is asking, can I use the REST APIs to deploy to workspace? 
is from a PDIP project. So the, the question was online was, um, are we able to use the REST APIs to deploy PBIP? Uh, so Power BI projects, so you are able to do that. Uh, I'm not sure where that is in terms of the preview features. I think quite often the APIs come before the UI features get released. So uh, yeah, I think you can do that. Um, I think there's a question at the back from... Uh, so the question was, do we have a date for when PBIP is, is due to come out? Um, I don't know. I, I, I couldn't say. <laughs> Sorry. Um, who was first? I didn't see. Um, do you go first? Yep. Um, so the question was, for PBIP, will you need Pro or Premium? If you want to do the, the workspace integration with Git, then that is a premium or a fabric uh, feature. If you want to just use Power BI Desktop and just save the files, that, that's local to the client. You don't need a premium license to do PBIP within Power BI Desktop. And the, and the yes. Uh, lady at the back. So the question was around um, works. Uh, merge conflicts between the workspace and the, the local environment. So because we're now using the, the model.bim definition, those merge conflicts will, will be flagged as they, you know, as they would say if we were doing SQL or C-sharp because it's on a line-by-line -line basis, whereas pre... Yeah, so you, you, the question was if you can use incoming or, or choose the which side to take on the conflict. So yeah, you could drop into DevOps and, and, and do that. Um, the issues we had with PBIX, as I said, sort of earlier on, is that it's around, um, it, it's a binary file. It just has it changed, yes or no. There was no, there's no, you're unable to detect what the changes are. Um, and then, yeah, I think that's it for. Oh, sorry, there was a question here. Sorry. Uh, so the question was around um, if we use the APIs to deploy, will they update apps? Um, there are API calls for for updating apps as well. Um, so you just need to invoke those to to, to pick up any updates. Um, but yeah, that that's it for me. Any feedback? The links there if the if the QR code doesn't work. But I appreciate you coming in and sort of attending my session. So thank you. Thank you.